Thank you all for coming to the library room this evening. I'm Bruce Moore. I've been a resident in town here since 1956. And grew up playing in the quarries in town and ended up getting on the historical commission and started researching stuff and talking to people. The older they get, they, if they pass away, then the information goes with them. So you've got to get information from people when you can. It's just going to be an impromptu discussion tonight. And please, if you have any questions, just raise your hand or, you know, and I'll call it on you because it's going to be whatever you want to talk about, too. There's plenty to, if you want to talk about something I'm talking about or get an added description, just let me know. Let's see. Um, so obviously, we're famous for the rotary in town. Plus, our, uh, before that, though, it was the sandstone, which um, our, one of our prominent buildings is the town hall. Built in 1882 from the kidney stone, right where the old dump used to be. If anyone, an old town member, remembers where that was, where Clarence was on Kibbe Road there. It's now filled with, um, there was two quarries there, one's landfilled and the other, uh, John Romito lives on that one there. Let's see, I've got to figure out where to start. Bruce, what did you say? The other the one was a landfill, and one was John. That's there's John still a quarry. John Romito. There's a right of way there where the power company has, and John Romito lives on one. Dick Stack lived next to the other one. Okay. And then they built a couple houses in there. So where are you talking about? The quarry at Kibbe Road. Oh, okay. He just oh. asked a question. Yeah. I'll try to relay the question if I can. Um, the quarrying industry in our town was more an offshoot of the quarries in um, Connecticut. That they came up here. They were harvesting stone in the 1600s down there in Connecticut. And a lot of our quarry workers from Sweden came up here. They migrated up here after that. They started out with a 200-foot hill down there in Connecticut, and it, um, they mined that down, and then they started mining, making gravestones and buildings in New York, stuff like that. So a lot of our workers, once we figured out that there was a use for it, then it became more profitable to mine out of the ground. So I just got to find a starting point here. Um, who found out about the, the stone being here in East Long Meadow and it was worth quarrying the people that owned the Connecticut company um, that just kept looking? Well, at it. the stone carvers, uh, Herman Newell, came here and the, he married Lois Burke, who lived in Gina's house. And they, um, they owned a quarry here in town, so he's a very famous stone cutter. A lot of his stones are in Long Meadow. So they liked the East Long Meadow stone. I mean, we were part of Long Meadow at the time, but they liked our stone because it was, it, you could letter it very crisply and you can still see the letters very clear today. I'm gonna show you later some of the, why the Portland, Connecticut stone doesn't work out too well. They have issues with their stone that we don't have here in our town. Um, don't have a starting place. Um, well, I'll just, a lot of the guys that came down here in the summer were from Canada. We, every summer the, when the trains came in, the Canadians had come down here to work in the summer. So you had crews of Canadians and the Swedish would work in their crews because they, they didn't speak the same lingo and they didn't probably get along. So you can usually tell the, like this, Picture here is a picture up where Danny Burak lives on Summers Road. This was a 1901 story. Uh, Algot Carlson is here with the crew. Of, they're all Swedish. They all look like they're cut from the same mold. <laughs> and they're, they mostly have mustaches. The Canadians are usually bushier or more 
beards, you know, it's cold up there in the winter. <laughs> a lot of our town ancestors are in the, Art Anderson's father's in here. A lot of people knew Art Anderson in town here. That's his father in here. They came up from Sweet, uh, from Portland, Connecticut. The Runquists in town were plumbers, Steve Runquist, a lot of you know him. His grandfather is in a lot of these pictures and they stayed in town. So a lot of these people that came up here stayed and lived in town here. I'll, I'll leave these out after you can kind of just peruse through them. Well, <coughs> this picture is from the Billings Quarry on Summers Road where Danny Burex lived across from the police station. This is another 1901 Howes Brothers photos. This is the same crew here, the Swedish crew. They're down in here. The guy would come out and take pictures more where he didn't have to go in the woods lugging this monstrous camera. So he'd just park it by the road and take his pictures. And No one ever smiled in these pictures because he had to stay still for, I don't know how long, a minute. <laughs> you know, to hold a smile for that long is pretty hard. But this quarry's underwater now. A lot of people have fished it and swam in it. That was called the Big Quarry. I don't, you didn't grow up in town. Anyone swim in that? Burex Quarry? You did? Did you call it Big Quarry or just... Did you call it the Big Quarry or just, just swam there? Yeah. Um, a boy drowned there, Leonard Clark, in the 30s, and all the parents made their kids go and watch him. They took the kid out with a grappling hook to find him at the bottom and the parents were trying to tell the kids this is a dangerous place don't swim here and they, they you know they got the kid out but you know that was the swimming hole everybody swam there and now you wouldn't think of swimming in a quarry because it's i don't know if perception has changed <laughs> <coughs> Once they got the stone out of the quarry, they would either use a six horse team, a four horse team, or these are oxen. This is our famous picture that's on the town seal. It's um, George Patrick, taken right where the DPW is now. That was the Taylor Stone yard. I'll show you that in a minute. Right where the DPW is. And he was a very famous guy. He's posing on the it's hard to see for everybody, but he's posing on the cart with a stone on it. Back in the old days, they could only take small stones out because it's only what would fit on the cart. And this one came out of, um, it's hard to tell how big it is, but it's probably from this wall over to here in this high. That's redstone. They took it, Chiporas took it out of the redstone quarry. They were able to take like 10 ton stones out later on. Let's see. And the, um, once they got the stone out, there was two places where they processed it, down where um, Hamden Engineering is now on the, on the rail trail. You can see the back end of that. That's where the Norcross brothers had this traveling crane. There, they had the railroad brought in here in 1876, otherwise there never would have been a railroad in town. And, they process their stone here and where, um, well, it's A.W. A. Brown was there, Whitaker before that, but it's behind um, Dunkin' Donuts now going towards Four Corners. That was where another uh, Rankin had his stone processing plant there. So the train could pick up stone there, then come up to Norcross, pick their stone up and head it off to market. Was Norcross the biggest? Absolutely. All the, it was all rinky, well not rinky thing, but they were all small outfits up till Norcross came in and they did the buildings of Trinity Church and... Um, okay. We worked with H.H. Richardson, right? H.H. Richardson, right. Yep. He was a master architect. And they built the Waldorf Astoria, the original Waldorf Astoria where the... What is it? 101 stories, the 
Empire State Building. I haven't thought of that. Before. Yeah. They they tore the Waldorf Astoria down and sold the land for 29 mil million and built the Waldorf Astoria. And they dumped all that redstone out in the harbor in New York. But the first three floors of that whole building were made from redstone up behind Graziano Gardens. They're just a total waste of stone. But that you know, progress in the city. You got to get rid of the old. And Put the new up. But Norcross employed two to three hundred men, and James and Mara had another two or three hundred men. They had stone quarries in town, but they brought all their stone to Springfield down on Lyman Street near the um, train depot there and shipped it out. They processed it down there. But they were they were a huge employer of men here. The quarry industry ended up dying out because the workers wanted to, I think it was go from 23 cents to 25 cents an hour. And mm -hmm. to that many men, it was a lot of money, and they, the quarry owners just shut it down. They said, we're all done. And they had enough stone on hand for another 15 years without the workers. Oh, wow. And by then, brownstone was being replaced by other building materials, so there was a decline in the industry. So the heyday was in the 1870s and stuff like that. Question? Yes, ma'am. When did it start? When did they start getting the rocks? The, the Indians used them. <clears throat> I have a mortar I got at the museum from Ronnie Goldstein. That the Indians ground the corn in them because it's a soft stone. They used it. And they left them behind because they went from one place to another. So they were able to... Ronnie dug it up when he was digging his field. He just plowed it up and it popped out of the ground. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, you, well, you say they processed the stone on Lyman Street, or they processed the stone here. What do you mean by processing? What did they do? Well, if, if they had buildings that needed certain stones to certain sizes, okay. they could shape up. You're getting the rough stone out of the ground at the quarry bringing it down here, like they did it um, where Pioneer Gymnastics is. Chiporis did that with larger blocks of stone, and they cut it up into pieces to use for projects like that. And they had this, the stone cutters where they are doing, if you had um, bases for monuments for cemeteries, curbing, they did all kinds of steps for your house. They, they had people doing whatever they needed to use the stone for. They weren't shy about using it. Yes, Beth? Well, back in the 50s, I went to the University of Vermont, and I was homesick. I went in the library there, and it was a beautiful, big brownstone library. And sitting there feeling homesick, I saw on the wall, stone from East Long Meadows. I said, at least I'm home, partly. <laughs> Before the railroad came, you could only ship it as far as an oxen or a horse could take it, which wasn't too far. Sometimes in the winter, they would drag it down the ice in the Connecticut up to West Springfield. There were some carvers up there using it, but till Norcross came in, it wasn't known worldwide. And now once the railroad was in, anywhere there was, the tracks went, the stone went. You can, once you see brownstone, you can start pinpointing it, you know, wherever it is. Where did, um, or when did Chiporis start working in Redstone Quarry again? They reopened it in 65. Yeah. They had an order for the New York University. So they bought the property from the Lindners and cleared the old quarry. They drained it so they could see which way the stone ran. And then they opened up the new quarry, they took 25 feet of overburden off the top to get to the layer of stone underneath. And they were um, up at Brown, this is where this picture is at Brownstone Gardens. There's two huge chunks still up there. They're redstone at Brownstone Gardens. Chiporis had them brought up there. They used to be lined up in big, you know, we jumped on one to another as kids up there. They were all stored up there until they needed them. I have a question. Yes. Yep. I, I wanted to ask, um, it's simply a matter of pure chance that the way the ground formed, 
I mean, how did this stone get into the... Well, if, if you have Because then mountain, there was layers of soil it, on top. It's called um, an alluvial fan where the stone got washed down from and away from the mountainside as it, as it came off through erosion and stuff. So it, it, it layered itself in beds <laughs> on, the, on the floor, some of them hundreds of feet thick. And then other things happened in the earth, you know, that deposited other junk on top of them. So how so did they know it was here the, to begin with? Some of it was right on top of the ground, like they did it plowing. And then you could just dig it out. They used the first stuff for foundations for buildings. You know, you just carve out. It came out of the ground in chunks, so you could carve it out for your foundations for the house. And then it got, someone said, well, let's make building out of it, stuff like that. But they chased the vein, if you were on north to south, where Pleasant Street starts all the way to Kibbe Road, they're chasing that vein. That's like one quarry after another along that whole route there. And on Burak side, it just extended over the road there. And, I mean, it went into 16 acres, they mined brownstone there. And, it's not we're not exclusive but ours was the best stone in town here it had a real fine grain to it um i guess i can show you this the, yeah not many here but like portland connecticut and a lot of places in um they dig them around new england you know there's layers of tracks not necessarily in the rock. I mean, the, a lot of the stone is cruddy stone. You can't use it for building. It's just mudstone, so the tracks are in there. A lot of people used to dig them around. Not, are you saying not in brownstone? Yeah, it is in brownstone, oh, okay. a lot of them. But, but they're not the higher quality stuff. In our quarries, you don't see much tracks because it, it was probably laid down rapidly. I don't see, there's 100 feet without any separation of junk in it you know so i don't know what wow. if it was the great flood or what what got it there in that without interruption but this is an actual piece of a gravestone from portland connecticut and when the rock is formed it's called a bedding plane it's laid down in layers like a book so when they, they didn't maybe they knew it but they turned it up on edge to make your gravestones, because that's an easier side to carve, the side that's smooth. And then the water would get in the top of the stone and split the face of it. This is split off of the face. So all of this was from like 1799 stone from Portland, and you can't read the names of the people that are buried there. The stone is just destroyed. And you can kind of tell Portland, it's got bits of mica in it, and our stone is a little harder than theirs. This just crumbles. It's pretty sad. And the, uh, get, the stone cutters that cut our stone here, a lot of them died like 40s from stone cutters consumption. That would we would be emphysema. This um, I'll just take a tool. This, that's just two seconds and this is more heavier particles but they would you're cutting the stone all day long you're breathing that mm. silica dust without knowing it no one had a mask then and your lungs filled up with silica dust and you, you were the second highest paid people in the industry other than the owners of the quarry but you died the yeah. fastest <laughs> and the kids started apprenticing like at 14 and at 18 or 19, you'd be a stone cutter, and then you'd be dead at 40. So oh, wow. it, not a lot of them lived, unfortunately. It was just, no one knew what it was. It was uh, what do they call it? Hazards of the trade? Yes, ma'am? How many actual quarries are there in the town? Um, that's a good question. The, the old timers in the book say around 50, but oh, wow. a, a whole half the size of this 
would be considered a quarry, you could just take stone out for your cellar and it's technically a quarry hole. And I found 35 of them so far, that, but not many major ones, you know, half a dozen major ones. Like even the one on Summers Road, where Brownstone the lake is now, that started out as a tailor quarry, and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and where the dump is now, the transfer station, that was Salisbury Quarry. And further down, you got the Kibbe Quarry. So they've all, people just work the same vein. You know, it's, and they call it, wherever they are, it's just called a quarry hole. What was the one on the back side of Lee Street, up, up in the woods? That's Pine was that, Quarry. Was that connected to the one on Pleasant Street? And it went no. back further in that direction? No? No. They're totally Pleasant is still Pleasant Quarry is still there. It's Brownstone Lake, and Pine Quarry is the one up behind Lee Street. Okay. There's a couple of guys here, Bill and Mike. They... There's a group of us that take care of the pine quarry. I, I got some brochures you can take, but there's a box up there. Uh, John Agnoli helped me with a map we did up there. There's conservation land. You can go up there, park at Wingate, and go cut across the power line and walk right in to the quarry there. It's open to the public. 24 hours, about 12 months of the year. There's a video on YouTube called The Visit to Pine Quarry. Don Mackey did it from LTAP. So you can get a gist of what went on out there. But it's just a wonderful place you can walk. And it's legal to go there. There's no one going to bother you. A lot of us uh, work the trails to keep it clear, yes? I was wondering if the town has any, um, you know, if they're going to develop it a little more. I've been there quite a few times. It's beautiful there. They're, but I'm just wondering if they're going to, I know that you have... Develop the quarry? No, yeah. I mean develop, you know, the trail to do more with it or no? You no, know, there are cart paths out uh, there made by right. the... Um, these were all done by the oxen out there, so right. we're just leaving them the way they right, are. You can't, oh, okay. And is that the only quarry that's on uh, town land, conservation? Well, Hoover's quarry is on Parker, on Kibbe Road, but it's so overgrown now because no one's using it. That's where we all swam as kids. Yeah. It's so overgrown and the deer ticks are horrible out there. You go through the briars and the overgrown brush, you're just gonna be covered with deer ticks. It's really a nightmare walking around in certain areas of town here. First, the uh, quarry on John Street, is that where the Village Green is now? Where was that one? Right. Um, at the rear end of CVS there, right at the okay. beginning of John Street. Okay. Thank you. The, the town filled that in. Yeah, so there's I, houses I live, built right, on it. Yeah, now. I've lived right around there for my whole life, and I'm going, yeah. where, the, where is it? Yeah, I mean, there's a picture of it. You can see the, the old schoolhouse in the corner where Forest Area Smith is, so you can kind of eyeball from that yep. where it is. <laughs> Yep. Bruce, you, you mentioned there's quarries in 16 acres. Yep. Uh, how far north does it extend, this this grain of, of redstone? Camp Wilder yeah. was a redstone quarry. Does um, it go behind Kylie the Junior High yeah. and where the shop right was at the start of that plaza. I don't know what's in there now, Burlington Coat Factory. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It went, and then now you're morphing into the redstone quarry on Elm Street. So that's the same vein going that go beyond, say, Indian Orchard and the Chickabee River into the I'm not sure how, honestly, how far the vein so. goes. I don't know. So they, they never attempted to find the beginning of company then, huh? Well, the guys were only interested in our town. True. You know, you, you could only mine the land where you own. <laughs> I mean, Norcross came in and they would lease your land first, and then they figure out enough to buy the land. So they bought a lot of <laughs> six or seven of the quarries around here in the 1870s. Didn't they have ones in Connecticut as well? They had quarries, um, granite and marble. They were smart enough to, every stone you needed to fabricate a building, they bought a quarry for it, and they'd hire the guys, and they'd fabricate that stone and bring it there and build building cheap. You know, that's that. 
town hall was built for 7200 bucks. They donated the stone. That's, you know, that's eight. If you look at those blocks, they're from the Kibbe Quarry. Those suckers are bigger than this table. And somehow they got them up there. It's the original mortar. It's only like an eighth of an inch thick. It's still, you can see where they mucked it out. They didn't have to rake it. They had a red dye in it. And it looks fabulous there. It's never lost its luster or spalled off. That's what this is called, when it, it spalls. The brown stones in New York that were made of the Portland stone, that's why it went out of favor. They started spalling. The fronts of the buildings started coming off, and people don't want to look at that. And we had brown stones in New York that still look good, but we fell under the wrath of the people that fell out of favor with the brown stone that was looking lousy. They're restoring a lot of that now. They have crews in New York trying to bring it back to, you know, put a face back on the buildings that are, they're beautiful buildings. So is there quarries still operating in East Long Meadow that can refurbish the... Um, it's hard to find stone anymore in town. To, they were going to take the pier out at Pine Quarry. Jacoris wanted it one time for the Smithsonian, but the town Thankfully, he said no, because they ended up finding a bridge somewhere. They took down a bridge and used all the brownstone for that. Mr. Stack sold some stone for the Smithsonian on Kibbe Road. He had a big pile in the yard, and they give him some cash, take it away. Yes, sir? Back in the 1800s, how did they cut those huge sections of stone? Well, they. These are drill holes in the rock. They would drill down in the rock. Norcross had steam drills, but the other old timers had to hand drill them down. And then you put black powder in the hole, and you just touch the powder off to crack the block vertically. And then, where is that? Oh, it's hard to tell, but. These guys are on standing on a plank. They, they have these pins and feathers, chisels, and they're trying to take this rock, this big, long section. Once you have it split this way, you go down if you want a three-foot block or two-foot block, and you put the chisels in there and split it this way and crack it off. Then it just comes, you lift that out with the derrick, which is um, these. These are the lifting tools for the stone, these big derricks, a mast and a boom. Um, Norcross had steam power because they had money. The old derricks down in Jim's quarry, he owns the Pease quarry, or McKnight's quarry, whatever. <laughs> but they would hand crank the derricks to move that stone. And so you could only, you know, you're not going to move a 50 ton stone. With... <laughs> so that's why the stones are smaller. <clears throat> This would be one of the cables that they used to, um, that would be on the derrick. On the side, holding the mast up, you had smaller wires than this guy wires all around to hold the mast up. And then on the boom, you had bigger cables to lift up the rocks out of the quarry with. And this, this is stiffer than a board because it's 140 years old. A lot of them in the middle of it had a hemp cord and they would oil that and you know put the hemp in, make the cable and then it would be flexible because it wound around a drum. The old quarries, they would either have a horse walking around a drum to work the cable or just manually winch it like that. It depended on the money you had for your operation. But the wrapping on this is spectacular. <clears throat> to hold this in place so it wouldn't come undone, they just wrapped this so beautifully and finished the end on it. Out there. Okay, so what do you think this thing is here? Anyone got an idea? A fish hook? <laughs> yeah, you would think it would go on the end of the derrick to lift up, you know, the, um, the weight of the stone, it would be up here. But 
this one, it just doesn't look big enough to be strong enough to lift a 500 pound stone. But, well, I found a picture of this. This is from the 1880s. It's the, almost the exact same thing. I think they used a bigger hook up here and they wrapped the stone around with a, a big chain and then lifted it with that. So this, this happens to be a cataclysmic event that happened at the quarry. They were lifting the stone up, but this would have been wrapped and the weight was too much. So this is a handmade chain link that split that and this is supposed to have more of a bend on it. It split, it did widen this up here. So that was part of a, I just found the two of them together. And until I saw this picture, I couldn't figure out, like, how can they lift that big of a stone with that? You know, it must have been crazy when that thing dropped, you know, someone's down below and you got a thousand pound stone coming down on your Were there, um, uh, accidents where people... Yeah, there were accidents. I'm sure people got crushed fingers, and I know people got killed on Chaporis's place over there. They they went through the rock planer, or they got a, well, they were sawing rocks, and one fell on a guy. I mean, it's not very gruesome. What do you, what's this? Anyone have a hazard to guess? I got, I got one of those at home. <laughs> right, but it's razor sharp on the ends, right? So when when Norcross guys came in, they each stone that came out, if you look at it out of the quarry now, there's a hole. This the guy would pick axes on each end of the stone, and they had these big rock tong, tongs like this. They would clamp on that, and when you lift it up, it locks it in there, and then you could lift the rock up with that. Because I, I saw the holes for years and couldn't figure out why is every rock have a hole on the end? Just, just an inch or two deep, but that would have been a guy less skilled. That's your job. Make a hole in the, you know. But you had to learn the trade, too. You know, the guy, you worked your way up through the trade. And those guy wires I was telling you about, this is a hold down for the guy wire, when when they bring them to the ground, they could, this is um, got a nut and a bolt on each end, so they could crank these up and tighten it around the guy wire so it wouldn't come off. You know, you don't want to have that mast go flying off somewhere. Somebody had to climb up there and put those on the, guy, on the ropes, guy wires on there. But that's a cool artifact from the other. Anyone know what that could be? Looks like I, when I was a kid, I thought they were meteors. I, you know, but unfortunately, they're not. They're uh, clinkers. They're called when they burn coal yeah. in the steam boilers out there to run the winches for the derrick. The stuff that didn't burn was called a clinker. So they, the guy, that's another guy's job: shovel the clinkers and crap out of. Excuse me, out of the back of the boiler and out the quarry you'll see piles of these on the ground out there. So you know there was a steam engine right nearby that. And if you look you can find the bases for them a lot of times. I think in Jimmy's quarry there's a bar Derrick base and yeah. at least one yeah. there. Yeah. He gave a tour of his quarry a few years ago with Merle Safford there. That's he on the quarry man too. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Up at Center Hill Park. It, Jan, Jim and Jan McKnight commissioned that for the town for our 100th anniversary there. That beautiful quarry man statue up there, they had it cast in bronze. He took the rocks from his quarry, he found one with a, a natural thing for the guy's foot to stand on. And this is, that was a big, thank you so much for doing that. There's a video on that too of the dedication of that. It was kind of fun. Yeah, and expensive, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, all right, I got to tell you a story. Everyone's heard of uh, Finding Bigfoot on TV? Yeah. <laughs> I 
It should be titled, Not Finding Bigfoot. <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story that I heard out at one of the quarries in town. The guy that owned the land was farming the land, and he heard some kind of uttering, like something was in trouble or whatever. He went out there, and there's this creature in the quarry struggling, like it's drowning. A big hairy creature like Bigfoot and he took a long pole or you know log and, and rescued the thing and it was so tired when it came out it just like on the ground and its hands were all um, bloody from trying to get out of the quarry scratching the stone and I said sure I heard the story I said yeah right it's Bigfoot you know and I went out there and I found this on the wall of the quarry <laughs> where it had scratched it. So we might become famous for the tourist attraction. Johnny, where's Johnny? You can give tours out there to see the, where the big one. Well, that's actually the legend. The real truth is the, everyone knows Johnny and Dick Turnberg. Their father was out at the quarry or on his land they bought up to the quarry and the mr turnberg eric i think he heard someone hollering for help and he he ran out to the quarry and there was a young boy with a red shirt i guess he was already underwater and he dove in and saved the kid so that was that's the truth to that story so you know i thankfully did that but where i'm figuring these so how did these get here this was the Taylor Quarry stone yard up where the DPW is now. These are all stone cutting sheds with all the men are in there. Um, a company colorized that. But there's like 38 guys in here. So they're in there making their different, you can see some of the stuff they made for the quarry industry, the different shapes and stuff. So all their tools are handmade by the blacksmith. So they, if they're making an urn or something, or excising material out, you got to sharpen it, right? So this looks, this was found at the Taylor Quarry, and it's the same stone from Taylor. So I'm thinking the guy sharpened his tools with this, just like that, for a long time. Because I mean, somebody made these marks. You know, you wouldn't waste your time. So instead of call them the blacksmith, you could just sharpen, here, have the kid, they had a print, just, you know, go sharpen my tools, kid, okay, so that's what I think, that stone, for real. 25 cents a day, probably, yeah? Yep, and the stone cutters at these sheds are using these wood mallets, you know why you use a wood mallet instead of a metal hammer, because metal on metal, you could get, yeah. and you're at, these are, 1870 tools and you could use them they're just as good as they were then because you can see how worn this is it's usually yeah. beech nut or something you can work that chisel all day long and it's all nicely patinaed from a quarry worker using that you want me to pass some of these around yeah. not the crandling hammer <laughs> Was that mallet found out at a quarry? No. No, they would have disintegrated. You don't see any derricks out there either, because once they fell down, yeah. they, I mean, in the fort in the World War II, they went out and scabbled all the metal for the war effort. So if there was a derrick on the ground that had pieces of equipment on it, they'd take them off and remelt it for the war effort. And then the log would, just decay again. How did, how did you come about getting that? Which was, was it a family, you know, yeah. donated? Yeah. 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 I bought that from a guy a long time ago. So there's no derricks on the Isn't there one in Beckett, though? There is. There's one on the ground in Beckett, and one they, they reestablished re up in the air mm -hmm. there. But there's none in, in around here. No, they, they have a different kind of a derrick, a bull wheel on the bottom. It's a little different base up there. But their um, machinery, 
is similar. That's a granite quarry up there. That's much harder rock to work with than yeah, brown stone. Of metal. I mean, a lot of <coughs> yeah, that's a wonderful place to hike up there. Yeah. So speaking about, obviously we're not from here. Um, the bulk, the bulkhead at Wingate. Is it at Wingate? Because we came in the winter looking for some of the quarries. We went. Then you're talking about the nursing home. Yeah. Yep. The wind bulkhead gate. somewhere in the back room. Trailhead, I mean. Yeah, the trailhead. Yep. Is somewhere in the back parking lot area? Yeah, you cross the power line. It, it, there, on the video, you can kind of see where to go there. there. Then there's a sign there that says Pine Quarry in a, in a box with a map set oh, okay. So you, you can't really get lost there. All the trails intersect. The mountain bikers have been going out there too, making their own trails, so you can kind of meander around. When you're on the smaller bike trails, you have to pick up a tick now and then. So just you wear light clothes out there. You don't want to wear dark clothes because if you can't see the tick, you can't afford to get bit. You know, it's much too dangerous. You know, when we were kids, you rolled around under the pine trees. Nobody <laughs> cared about a tick. They had um, different colors of the stone. You can always tell the. Worcester stone because it's so light. It's what is it? Berkshire Bank now near the ponds. That's made with this stone. Chaporis built that, and this is from St. Michael's Church. That was the last building built in town, 1970, from the red stone. They re when Chaporis reopened it, they used the stone, and then they um, Quinn Construction worked with Chaporis to build the. Uh, the church there on summer on Maple Street. Does anyone go to St. Michael's Church? Yeah. I don't. I got four pieces of the redstone. <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't. Need, I can get you one. <laughs> who, here, who, who had their hand up? You want a piece of the stone? Yeah, Are there any fire residences that were done? They, yes, on Calendar Avenue. The corner of Calendar Avenue and Summers Road. Uh, Mr. Jackson was a stone cutter in town. The lower half of that house, Mrs. Skippington lived there for years. That lower house is all brownstone. There was one on Kibbe Road on Parker Street that they tore down to make, I think, Ramona's Way or one of that, that new development. They couldn't take the brownstone house there, so they tore it down. What was it, Calendar? <coughs> Calendar and Summers Road, right near St. Michael's Rectory. There's a big urn in the front yard there. Oh, yeah. Mrs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That house is gorgeous. Two kinds of stone, and the one next to it, the brick house, was from the 1830s. That's just, um, this stone, the white brown stone. This has 1% less iron in it. That's what makes the difference. It, when the beds were all laid down, they were probably the same color, but depending on where it sat in the earth, there was more iron in the ground in some areas. So this didn't get as much iron. This got a lot of iron. And then the Kibbe stone, which is a brighter red, brownish red, <coughs> that's the town hall. That's got um, a little less than this one. When they're wet, they look a little darker. If you go to um, the town hall, You'll see all three shades here. This is the Norcross brothers offered three shades of stone when they were mining. The Maynard Quarry up behind Graziano Gardens. The land was owned by the Maynard, so they called it the Maynard Quarry. Um, this is the Kibbe Quarry on Kibbe Road. And then the last one is the Worcester. They called it Worcester quarry because they were the Norcross brothers were, were from Worcester but they bought the Taylor quarry and renamed it the Worcester quarry. A lot of the quarries have several names. You know whoever like Hoover's quarry was another that's who lived there on the land the Hoover's quarry so you just named it like you could call Jim McKnight's quarry now, or Burex quarry we just call them like whoever lived there. But in front of the town hall you see all three of these. The building itself is a Kibbe stone um, the 75th anniversary stone in front, the bright red one, that's the stone from Maynard Quarry. 
And then the lighter one, the 100th anniversary seal, that's um, the Norcross Brothers Worcester Stone, which of course donated, the family donated both of those to the town for a gift. I mean, you know, it's a fabulous gift to the town. That family did a lot for this town. They're great people. Oh. This is another tool that your grunt laborers would be putting a finish on stone with this. If this wedge comes out of here and all these teeth are interchangeable. This would be the working edge here where they're all the same width. So you can adjust them and put the wedge back in. So when they made, if this was a step for your front yard, someone would put a pattern on here with this. So when redstone gets in the winter, it's slippery or slimy after a couple of years and you don't want to go out and take a header so they make a herringbone pattern. It was really an art to do that, but if you swing this sucker for an hour, you'd be <laughs> begging for mercy. You know? Should I pass that? It's too heavy to pass. Let me pass some of these. A couple of tools. That's a sawtooth chisel that puts a different pattern on the stone. And that's a pick, just a flat chisel there. I don't think they're too rusty. Just send a couple of them. But every, every stone cutter had their name on that tool because that was a valuable tool back then. You made your living with that tool. So if someone, if you left it on the job the next day, someone's got it in their back pocket and you go, hey, Got my tool. If you couldn't prove it's yours, so we got a lot of tools at the museum that have different names on it. Like Mr. Cooley died of stone cutter's consumption at an early age. Someone took all his tools, stamped their name on it. So now it's their tool. So it got passed down. I collected them for 20 or 30 years and then donated them to the museum. Down there. Okay. You can come down and see a lot of the quarry tools down there at the museum along with other. Which museum stuff. is here? It's 87 Maple Street, next to the North Cross House. Oh. It's open the third Saturday of every month. Bruce, you would the tools specific to the Redstone, I mean, was, were they invented for the Redstone or did you Every buy granite has their own tools. You know the stone cutters at different. They probably couldn't use a wood mallet for granite. That's that stuff is brutal to work with. They probably use. I don't know that much about the tools for granite, but I guarantee it's a lot harder. They had the flint quarry up in Munson. They had a big Munson. A lot of the cemetery stones up there are granite, or the, half the town is granite in Munson. That's what they're famous for. Their crown ball. Pardon me? Which school? The Munson State School. Oh, yeah. That was the Flint Quarry, yeah. The high school there. It's fenced off. They made a dump out of it. Right? They're making a hiking trail around it now. They want to do that. But it's a very short trail. Oh, oh, that's a picture of some of the stone cutters there. They got all their little um, apron. I'm sure when you came home from work, the wife didn't want to throw that stuff in the wash. <laughs> you know, the, the whites. You know. <laughs> I know one of the guys, um, Ann Wood from town, his mother said when he worked for McCormick, he would come home, they, his pants would about stand up in the corner. They had so much red dust on them, and they, you know, just leave them, their stuff over there. Most of them wore like uniforms out. They didn't wear their street clothes out there. They just changed into something. You know, you don't find money out there because they, they got paid once a month, and they all ran a tab. Um, let's see, what's there now? It was where Big Ben's is, that was the hun block there. They, all the stores in there, all the stone cutters would run a tab up there for the month. And then when you got paid once a month, you'd go in and settle up 
for your bread, your rum, or whatever you you bought there. And a lot of the houses were rental in town at the time. And then when the stone industry died, a lot of houses were empty in town for a long time. The, the town population plummeted big time in town here. Could have bought land cheap. <laughs> it sure reversed itself. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I wanted to show you one more. This is the big rock up at Redstone. I mean, a brownstone. It's made of redstone, but it's in brownstone gardens. It, it's about taller than I am. That Chiporus left that up there, but these are the drill holes that they made. And then it's kind of hard to see. The, the bedding plane is on a big angle there. So like with the tectonic plates colliding or volcanic action or something, the beds were all laid flat to begin with. Like the summer's road quarry, they're dead flat, they come out beautiful. And up at Pine Quarry, they're all, the, the beds are on an angle, so the rocks are all fractured and broken. That's why you see like hundreds of tons of, de of rock they couldn't use out there at Pine Quarry. You look at it and say, what did they take out of the ground? It's all here. And they didn't have a use for that leftover stone back then. You know, now they would, people, $25 a foot if you go down to the salvage yard to buy a piece of redstone. But they, they didn't have a use for that stone, but now it'd be worth a lot of money. Does anyone have any other questions? You can come up and look at this stuff if you want. Oh, yes, sir. Who's the current owner of redstone? Keith Linder. They're working to put 20 houses up there right now. Is there a way to get back there now, Bruce? Yeah, for Redstone Drive, but it's At private. At that end? No, that goes around. It's private. He, he gets really <laughs> testy. <laughs> they come in from Spring Meadow, and they've been breaking in his house. He doesn't live there. They, they come under the fence. There's a big fence around it. They steal stuff from his house, they, they fish, but if whoever builds there, the quarry is going to have a liability, like if someone drowns in it, who's responsible for it? The homeowner? Yeah, but they're going to sue somebody, right? So they're working on perking the whole thing. But it sounds like after Chiporis had to declare bankruptcy because they were pumping the water from the redstone into the brook that runs on Cooley and Elm. The water was, being redstone, the water turned red. Instead of making a settling pond, he just pumped the water into the brook and the neighbors, you know, it's bloody red. You're, they, they freaked out and made them shut down. So he had to, do, he had so many orders for New York buildings that he had to shut down. The last thing they made was the Bob's Library in New York. I think it's 12 stories, 100% redstone. B-O-B-S-T, Elmer Bob's Library. It's, they shipped all that, he, he fabricated all of it right here with Pioneer Gymnastics, shipped it up there, I don't know how. I mean, I've, I've seen the building, the slacks are, it's huge. I don't know how many hundred tons they used, but. They, they had enough stone. They used to ship it out on the low boy trailers and stuff. They used to to come one in. block at a time? Yeah, yeah big block right so in the so middle of the city. So how many trailer, trailer loads is that to get up? Uh, I don't know. In the middle of New York in. City. Yeah. Matter of fact, before they were closing, my brother was working over there, and he used to drive a huge fork truck that lifted the... Oh, the rock? Yeah. I heard about that, a big, giant yeah. monster fork lift, yeah. right? And front wheels were like 15 feet high. Wow. <laughs> That's a monster. <laughs> yes, sir. Did they get the crane out of brownstone before it flooded? Um, I got a feeling it was left in there. That thing you see in the middle. Be in the middle. It's it, That's actually a saw, the base for a saw. They had a saw that ran all the way across the quarry to that island with a blade, a contiguous blade, and they would bring the big blocks out there from redstone and brownstone and saw them to a smaller proportion and then bring them down to the yard here. But did they take the crane out there? 
Yeah, oh, the, the big steel derrick is gone. That's just, when you look out at Brownstone near the gazebo, there's some pins sticking up. That's actually the base for the saw. The middle part of the saw it ran. They let it go around and it would cool the blade down as it went around the whole length. And it ran all the time. The neighbors said it would run all night long. It, it, another story with the redstone, they used to, when Chaporis had it, they're supposed to put a mat down when you blow off the overburden. Well, one of the ladies that lived on Summers Road, they never put the mats down because it took time. They, the rocks had come right up onto Summers Road and they'd shut the street. This is in the 60s. And one of them went over the road through the roof of her friend's car and there was a playpen next to the one and the rock landed right next to, and like they were more than ticked off. They went, you know, now you got to put the mat down. But the cops had just come down and shut the street down and they'd sweep the rock off the road. Okay, you know. Just the way things were. A little looser back then. <laughs> Anyone have any more questions? Yes. I have a question. When you were swimming in the quarries, how did you get out? I mean, I think some of the quarries, were there ropes or were there no, ways to climb out? No, you could climb, climb up. Yeah. Yeah. The Red Star had a beach. No, they had diving boards. Yeah. High diving board to Redstone. I, mean, I know more than one kid got a split head swimming there. <laughs> if you're not careful where you land. Did you have a question? Yeah, I wanted to ask you because I live on Spade Arden and I know Spade Arden is one of the streets that was built over the old quarries. So I'm wondering what, because we've heard stories forever. Of what are the quarries filled in with that they've got the houses built well, on? Leo, Leo Spate made Green Acre Lane and took the stumps from there and filled in the quarry. Tree stumps? Tree stumps. Tree stumps. And then built the houses on top of that. So when they settled, yeah, the sewer line cracked, the cellars, they've had nothing but trouble. Those houses that are built on the quarry have had nothing Some, but trouble. Yeah. One of the people next door to us, there was a tree that they just took down about maybe 10 years ago because they figured out it was built on a ledge and yeah. the tree was leaning well, right over the street and they, they finally took it out. But we've been told that there's cars, that there's all kinds of things. We haven't had a problem with our house. Yeah. Other than the normal sets, or other than normal, the normal settling. But other people have had problems. Same and I'm time. just wondering, yeah. you know, depending on what, <clears throat> what was there. And I know there was a sinkhole, a small sinkhole in one of the yards. That's from a tree stump rotting. He, he did it on Crescent Hill. There was a little the Malone quarry up there. And they filled that in with stumps. But and they had to fill it in with more than just stumps. Stumps and dirt. They built over it. They didn't. So what did where did they he, get he was the a dirt selectman from? in town and could do whatever he wanted. <laughs> but where did they get the dirt from? They were clearing they just, a street. You know, you're, oh, you're, okay. you're making you know a new road. You got plenty of fill growing. Oh, okay. The, the, one, the one on Crescent Hill, they, they built the garage and the lady parked her garage, car in the garage. She came out in the morning. She <laughs> was gone. And Johnny Turner <coughs> told me the story. He said I had to go up with the bulldozer, <laughs> pull her car up and out of it. And that house has settled big time. The, the roof line was. You know, Leo was a great builder, but I'm glad Ed isn't here to hear the story. <laughs> That's a great guy, too. Could you sue for that? Yep. What's the name of this quarry on Green Acre Lane? That was uh, Granger Quarry at one time. And uh, Charles Burton ran it too. The Grangers owned the land. They, they owned it at one time, so that it was the Granger Quarry for a long time. Was there a, a quarry called Garfield? Because that's what I thought. That's it too. The Garfield, I thought Springfield, yeah. I mean, that's what <coughs> was. Garfield, was. Yeah. But it was Garfield, Granger, you know, Burex Quarry has about seven names, just the people that lived there or owned it at the time. That's what we, you know, you went by. Some of them just stay like the Kibbe Quarry was always, we just call it Kibbe Quarry. Do you remember any other names you called them? But a lot of them, the one where the transfer station is behind the, 
police station. That was a beautiful quarry, Sneakers Quarry, we called it. They decided to make a landfill out of that. They put stoves and refrigerators in that, <laughs> filled it in in a year, and capped it over before recycling. Now all that rust comes out mm, of the yeah. swamp next to Brownstone. It's bright red, goes under Pleasant Street into the Connecticut. in the 60s. Yeah. But, you know, it, they can't clean it out now. It's probably too far gone to recycle the metal. But it was just, nobody was in the recycling. A lot of the quarries were dumps in town. The kidney quarry, they, they just back up your car, dump it in the water, and go away. Because it was a convenient place to, you know. Now, how much are we paying to get rid of our scratch? Yeah. 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 You know. Did they build houses on that now, too? It's not, there's too much methane in the ground. Still? Yeah, because they used, you could bring your garbage there too, so yeah, it's just they, a lot of methane. Everything went there. Even the one at Brownstone, they started making a dump out of that. And they were burning down there. It was so deep, the smokes just stayed right on the road level. And the environmental people finally shut them down and made people lean, cap it off. And, when they uh, moved the dump out there on Allen Street, was that a quarry too? I don't think so. It could have been. Because the house next to that, the, the town owns that brick house, it's condemned because of the methane in that house. The people had to move out of that. Even the fire stations got, they have to have a, there's a pump between the transfer station and the firehouse. They have, the firemen wouldn't be around. They'd be wearing their mask all day because of the methane from the dump. It migrates underground, I guess. Enough to be a problem. You can clearly see the pump up there if you go to the back to the dump there. That's quite an experience if you go there to the dump there. <laughs> quite a lot of fun up there. Any, no more questions for... That was great. All right. I guess. Great. Thank you. Thank you.